year. Thank you. Um, am I on? Um, it really has been a delight to think about preparing for tonight, although I have to say we envision this as a conversation of maybe 20, 25 people. Um, so the number is we're going to try to keep it a conversation as much as we possibly can. Uh, so thank you for inviting me here tonight. And I'm so glad that as part of my credentials it did not pop up that in my cell phone I have more bartenders cell phone numbers than a woman my age should have. Um, <laughs> And it comes uh, to me naturally by giving tavern tours and walking tours and other tours for Columbus Landmark, so please don't hold that against me. Um, it is not any part of my credentials for tonight. I hope that you understand that I can make that difference. Um, but you may wonder why somebody who's taught in Columbus schools for a very long time uh, actually uh, is talking to you about this topic tonight. And so I want to be totally honest and legitimate as to what my background really is. This is something I, I rarely disclose to many people here. Um, but I'm from Cleveland, not from Columbus. Um, developed a very early love of Columbus um, and came here as a undergraduate, but not, um, not until I left Bowling Green. There was nothing wrong with Bowling Green. I want to state that up front. It was a lovely university. I was there for about two years, but one year when they bused a small um, busload of school children from Bowling Green to a hill uh, a railroad uh, overpass outside of Bowling Green to show them what a hill looked like. And the kids got off the bus and they all went, ooh, I thought, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> so um, I came to Columbus and um, Columbus was much more what I was used to. I, it, truly, I had yearned for a city, which is what it really was. And since I couldn't afford a car and didn't drive, um, my usual mode of transportation was walking or taking the bus. And if you can imagine taking the bus from Ohio State down to downtown to Lazarus. And I was so used to seven department stores in Cleveland, which I could peruse at my leisure. And there was the Union, and there was you know, the, uh, Lazarus. But it was looking at um, what I see now, because I chair the University Area Commission for the last, <laughs> I think, three decades, um, is all the change on, on High Street. And it, it, it's a very surprising to me, as I'm sure it is to you. But I saw um, the short north. I, I saw all of that in a much more raw and different state. And then when I started teaching in Columbus schools, and I've only ever taught in two schools, uh, Indianola Junior High, which became a middle school, which I'm proud to say Ohio State did announce that they did purchase it this last year, and they are going to renovate it and save it. And I think it's, uh, it's a testimony to Upper Arlington, to be honest, because the architect was Howard Dwight Smith. And so, uh, you know, stadiums and schools and Poindexter Village. Let's hear it for Howard Dwight Smith. Um, but thank you, thank you. You know, you just don't get that reaction, but see, I, knowing he's a long-lived, you know, Arlington person with that background, I think is very important, because he cut across a lot of different fields in where he worked, and I think that's kind of where we are tonight, too, looking at a lot of different fields to kind of cut across. But um, when you teach predominantly, oh, I was at Indianola, and then after 20 years, I went into Fort Hayes, when Fort Hayes opened a high school, and there was another about 20 years there. So um, uh, in the meantime, at the same time I was teaching full-time, I was working um, internationally a lot with Ohio State, with Mershon Center, with Ukraine and Poland right after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, it got to the point where um, I would have thought I would be there once or twice and working with teachers and with uh, government people about how do you teach democracy in a country that had not been free and what do you do about materials and what do you do about lesson plans and all of that. That was really our work. I never expected to be going back there sometimes three and four times a year uh, at the same time teaching full-time and working pretty much full-time at uh, Landmarks as a volunteer. But all of it, when I think back, really added to what I think I hope I bring to this tonight. Um, I am uh, the daughter of a butcher <laughs> and in Cleveland in the East Side Market. My father worked predominantly in African American communities and uh, it was one of those uh, transitions for me which was very, very easy to Columbus because I had grown up in a much more of an integrated neighborhood than Cleveland is generally known for. I try to describe Cleveland as being in um, pie-shaped wedges. There are the poor Hungarians, the middle-class Hungarians, the rich Hungarians, the poor Jews, the middle-class Jews, the rich Jews, and we fan out from the lake in pie-shaped wedges. 
And so for me to look for where were those ethnic roots in Columbus uh, took a little bit more searching, but they are there and they still are here. And so a lot of the work that I'm doing contemporary is in neighborhoods like Hungarian Village, uh, down off Parsons Avenue and other places. And because of a humanities grant last year, uh, we worked in four different neighborhoods and the similarities of what shaped those neighborhoods were so startling to me, even though I thought, oh yeah, I can make this transition pretty well. I was not prepared for how much we are all affected by, um, by history, uh, by about immigration patterns and industrialization and national trends and local public policy, which we didn't necessarily have any part in, but we are still living through in both the good and the bad sense of the word. Um, so that's kind of the background. Um, in working predominantly with African American students and in a university area, which I've always lived in uh, for more than 40 years, um, it's the same inevitable questions. Why was it that 15th Avenue was a racial divided line? Why is it that African American families lived in the Wyland Park area and white families lived in the North area and what happened in between? And um, it was the same thing about looking at, uh, really, at Fort Hayes, because our students were coming from all over. I still work at Fort Hayes. Uh, I don't get paid. I have an office in the Shot Tower. And I, I feel like I received sanctuary from Dr. Ruff and the principal there. I work with social studies and English teachers to work on projects with them. So some of you may have seen the WOSU neighborhood program that was done about Milo Grogan. And those were the Fort Hayes students I've worked with for the last two years. Milo Grogan is our nearest neighborhood uh, to the school. And um, how many of you know where Milo Grogan is? Do you have a? OK. So the rest of you are a little bit uh, sort of not quite so sure. OK. Milo Grogan is the first real neighborhood you're going to find coming out of Cleveland Avenue from downtown. So as you're driving up Cleveland Avenue to the north, heading toward Westerville, you will pass Fort Hayes, which is a pretty big complex from the Civil War on. You go over the railroad tracks, and then immediately to your right is Milo Grogan. It's actually the home of the National Football League in some ways, because it was the panhandle uh, railroad workers who formed the original football team. Milo Grogan is an old Irish, Italian, African-American community. And in doing oral histories there, the students started to uncover a lot of wonderful and rich stories. Uh, Milo Grogan Area Commission I've known for a long time. Some of you may know where the old uh, elementary school is, the Milo School, which is an arts castle. And Rick Mann, who's owned that, he and I have been friends for a number of years. And then you cross Fifth Avenue and you start to go into Linden, Ave uh, Linden area, so South Linden and North Linden. Because of my peculiar credentials, I guess, in teaching English and history, uh, both. I always was on an odd schedule at Fort Hayes for lunch, um, which wasn't bad. I always ate with the custodians. And um, you learn a lot. You really do. Uh, if you're in teaching, the first thing they tell you to do is make friends with secretaries and custodians. And it is so true. The rest of your life will be so much easier. But for me, the joy was is that some of the custodians in Indianola had also come to Fort Hayes. And so we've known each other for a long time. And I think that is what starts to break down stories to, to, that make sense to you then. Um, I know where I'm going with this, but allow me to take one step back for a second about this, what brings us here tonight. There is recently as a study being done uh, for the Organization of American Historians about a lot of the WPA um, interviews that were done during uh, the 30s, the Works Progress Administration, and especially in the South, uh, that were being conducted uh, to give people uh, something to do, writers something to do. And so they were doing oral histories of slave narratives, especially in Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. And for uh, many people, many historians, these have been um, just the groundwork, the founding of what we thought we knew about slavery. And um, what's coming to light most recently, and I do mean recently, is that the interviewees um, were a little guarded because the interviewers were the sons and daughters of pretty much the landed aristocracy of the South. So in order to give somebody a job who is in college in the 30s and 40s, they were doing the interviews of the very people whose own families were tied together in a very peculiar institution, as it was called. And so the interviewees were often extremely guarded in what they said. Um, and so I think that what I want to illustrate is there is a moment of trust. And so when you start to actually 
trust people, your stories become much more authentic and your observations are much more reliable. And that's what happened to me with Columbus, with Columbus schools, being able to work with people and especially working with people who had not necessarily gone to college. They had just lived every single workaday lives and they were very open and honest about what some of the challenges were and some of the joys were. And that's what I wanted the kids at Fort Hayes to understand. So when they went out and interviewed, it was really on a very personal level. We made sure that we invited them over and um, we had lunch ready for them. And we sat down more like family to talk about things. And slowly there are other stories. Things I had heard about Columbus came out and then some of you may know about the famous MLS cards. Does this ring a bell? Multiple listing service cards. That they were uh, what we thought were 10,000 of these. These are the real estate cards before computers that were put into, uh, that were sent out to realtors. And some of you may even still have one of a property you own where there's a picture on one side and the description on the other, right? Now, of course, they're in books and then they're computerized. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the MLS cards came to us in a very strange way, came to me in a very strange way. I had a call from a realtor on the east side, a young man I know, and he said uh, there is a real estate office in Bexley and the owner is leaving and they're selling the property and they're leaving behind a catalog of uh, these cards and it's just a big file cabinet. And I don't know what to do with them but they just look too precious to throw out. And so I went over, all, of course, where are they? In the men's room, of course, so you know. <laughs> sort of in the men's room working through MLS cards and they're loosely in alphabetical order and you can pull out, uh, I don't know, I'm going to say Neal Avenue and I could pull out Neal Avenue and I could look at the back of the card and if the house had sold between 1950 and the 1970s, um, it's very likely there was a card in there. Okay? And on the back of the card was not just the price but sometimes the reason why people were selling. And so it became sort of interesting to read the front and the back and the front and the back and I'm looking up all of these in the university area and I'm thinking, my gosh, in fact there are pictures here of things and houses that had been gone since before I came in the 60s, so you know, what else is in here? And the more we looked, the more valuable it became. These things were in a cabinet where the drawers came out but they were so heavy. To make a long story short, there were not a thousand cards, there were not 5,000 cards. There were not 10,000 cards, nor 20, nor 30, nor 40. There are probably close to 100,000 cards. They're not all necessarily there because things get lost. And I started pulling them out for Milo Grogan. And then if somebody heard about it and they asked me to look up a certain street, I'd go looking and see if I could find things. Rarely did that pan out. But what was interesting about it was you could start to see patterns that were somewhat shocking, a little horrifying, and a little reassuring. I guess you get them all. And um, when the students started looking at the ones for Milo, uh, it was very apparent where property values were going and why they were going the way they were. And it was also apparent that there were some mixed emotions about people leaving what had been a formerly um, Irish, although that had long since passed, but Italian neighborhood, and the beginnings of an African-American neighborhood. And when you looked at it across the city, you could start to tell where the rapid movement was happening in the 1950s especially. And so sometimes on the back of the card, and you're dealing with kids who are reading this, and they don't have quite the institutional history to even make a guess what this means, and the back of the card said uh, retiring, and you didn't have to give a reason why you were leaving, uh, but just retiring, and that makes sense, you're downsizing, you're moving on. Others would say things like, um, have to sell immediately, we'll sell to good Negro couple, we'll help finance. Now, there's a, there's a curious word right there. Why would you have to help finance? And so the pattern starts to emerge as to which neighborhoods are quickly moving, which neighborhoods are sort of saying um, a little bit more stable in a lot of ways, and then you start to mirror that with anecdotal information. And for us in Milo Grogan, it came out to be a really remarkable little twist of events, something I would have not seen in Cleveland, to be honest. And that was the continuation, for the most part, of an African-American Italian neighborhood where people knew each other. And they, uh, they knew who they sold to, or they knew who they lived next door to. And I had opportunity, if you've seen that segment, to, um, we interviewed a woman who came out of the blue for us. We were winding up the project. And I had lunch with her one day through a mutual friend. She came out to the school, she had pictures, her father was a wonderful motorcycle collector. It's not that they were rich by any means, but they were part of that little part of Milo that got 
sort of split in half from it around the St. Clair area. There were a lot of Italian bakeries and groceries, and um, she had great stories for the students about how she and her sister loved the music of the, of the 30s and would stand on their bed at night with the window open, the kind where it drops down this way, and, uh, and listen to Drambuy jazz. And at that point, when she told the area commissioners at Milo about the Drambuy jazz, she had them in the palm of her hand. She knew, she knew the neighborhood, and they knew who she was. And there was, very obviously, this sort of sense of trust among people to, to be very honest about stories, about how things change. When you look at the history of something like um, Eastgate, which is off Nelson Road, you can see a neighborhood that almost changed. It's a textbook um, civil rights neighborhood. It, it goes from very early housing, in fact, one of the first recorded marriages that we know of uh, in Columbus, which is not even Columbus yet, uh, happens around the Nelson Road property. And uh, this is an uh, African-American couple who marry within the house, and that's a recorded piece of that history. And of course, there are all these little lumber mills and sawmills around Allen Creek that help to, to, to deal with you know, uh, the economy of the early days. And then you have what is essentially a pretty prosperous uh, uh, coming of age of neighborhoods uh, at the beginning of the 20th century uh, in which the Wagenbrenners lived and the Schmitz lived and a lot of other people. And then suddenly, when you have desegregation, there was a, a I would say within eight months, the entire neighborhood changed, and it changed hands. It was the, the fastest sort of rapid um, leaving that I had ever seen on uh, that undocumented history. And so how is it that some did and some didn't? And where, where does that put Arlington and whatnot? So what I'm hoping for tonight, long introduction here, but <coughs> I've, I've run out of bartender stories for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, is to really try to put in context a little bit more about the history of Columbus and about what's going on in a contemporary way, if that makes sense to you. So I didn't want to do it with, um, with overheads. I am not a person who likes to speak to the pictures behind me, and I'm the kind who always likes to carry something away. So I have an, uh, about five handouts and, in a sequence, and I'm going to give you the first handout uh, that will uh, kind of set the stage for this, and then we'll stop and ask a few questions at whatever comes to mind, and then uh, we'll go on to the next part. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. Not that you can't interrupt me at any time. I am a fast talker from Cleveland, so just wave at me. So if we look at uh, the first, of, the first of, of a couple handouts you're going to get, it's just a map, a simple map. Some of you may have seen it already. Um, and it's an early settlement map of Ohio. Uh, what maybe in looking at this, you do know what some of these little regions are. And for me, the most interesting thing is zero in on Franklin County for a moment. Franklin County, pretty much in the center there. Everybody find it? It's kind of in the uh, lower left-hand corner of the US uh, military district. And then there's a narrow slit that goes right across the county. And then the back end of it is the Virginia Military District. Um, it puts where we live as general in Franklin County in a very odd position. We are sort of this nexus of these land grants all come together. And I'm sure that you have uh, remember somehow that Columbus is founded actually out of the town of Franklinton, which is Lucas Sullivan, who is the surveyor who uh, comes to this area and sees a land for the first time that he is later going to stake out for himself where he wants to settle, and that is to be named in honor of Ben Franklin. So the county of Franklin, which, and there was an earlier map that we were all part of Ross County at one point. Um, but does anybody know where that little narrow sliver is? It's the refugee track. It's the refugee track, yes. Right, so Refugee Road is one boundary of the refugee track, and Fifth Avenue is the other boundary. And Fifth Avenue is the northern boundary, and Refugee Road, for the most part, is the southern boundary. And it's a narrow slice that comes right through Franklin County. What's interesting is, is that who does that bring here? Well, not necessarily the people that were intended, but it does start to bring off a frenzy of land speculation. The land was set aside after the American Revolution for those people in Canada or Nova Scotia who were um, burned out of their houses. They had sided with the American cause, and they had lost everything. 
And so the US government was compensating them for their loyalty. And really, out of that, probably only 17 or 18 families moved into that land. But they got land, and they could turn around and sell it. So for those of you who know Broad Street and may know where the old Taylor Mansion is on Broad, not far from East High School, that's probably the best example of a family who was here for a long time and who stayed. But what it does is it starts to draw these distinctions of, uh, first of all, arterials that cut across things that are so weird to explain. Think for a moment in your mind, and I'm going to do a program, I guess, in February uh, for Upper Arlington about, uh, for the, uh, uh, the, thank you, the, uh, the programs that are done on Saturday morning, all of a sudden I couldn't remember the, the extracurricular programs and things, about that Fifth Avenue boundary. But you go in and out of townships, you go in and out of little towns, you go in and out of industrial, and then you're in you know, the edge of Upper Arlington, and you're in Grandview, and you're at a quarries on one end, and it's just like this wonderful mishmash. <coughs> but how it all comes about is because there is a, essentially a, a division already given to the slice in between, and most of that land is going to go up for sale. Um, I recently met a man who was a storyteller who said that he grew up in upstate New York, but his um, ancestor was Jonathan Dayton, and he was very proud of that. Well, Jonathan Dayton is one of the four people who pretty much own Clinton Township, where we all are. And he said, when I grew up, he said, I was always told that Dayton, Ohio was named after our family. And he said, I would be very proud that now I live in Columbus, and I realize that's not true. And I said, no, but there is something named for you, and that's Dayton Avenue off Arcadia next to the Dairy Queen uh, in the university <laughs> area. So a bit of a come down, but it's a landmark to us, you know. So, uh, so sometimes, you know, these land tracts became kind of interesting, how they got divided. Like, you may find it interesting to know that Morris Road actually dates from 1810, the name of it. So somebody had their eye on it pretty quickly. The Virginia Military District was, for the most part, for settlers uh, who were a part of that civil, that civil, that American uh, Revolution, and had to get payment back. And of course, that puts Lucas Sullivan right in that category, right then and there. And I'm not going to go through all of the other um, ways that the land, you know, is sort of used. But I want to point out that Columbus is already an unbelievable mix from about 1797 to about 1840. Um, with people coming in who are looking for land, for cheap land, people who already have bought the land who are now selling it at a higher price, or they're already making decisions about how that land will be used. Land is power. Land is money. Land is investment. Land is something that was denied to many people from where they were, and it will still continue to be denied in the century that follows, the ownership of it. And so land becomes the most easily um, translated commodity. I often say on downtown walking tours that before there was Ohio State football, land speculation ruled Columbus. And there was probably the same fervent activity about who owned what than there is about who, wh what team is particularly uh, winning these days. But in the 1920s, there was a study done of Franklin County. And it found that it, Franklin County was the most fraudulent example of land oh. transactions because it was, it was unscrupulous. It was, those were just the illegal ones. Then there were people like Lucas Sullivan, who became an executive for many people's, executor for many people's wills and their land, or sometimes his reputation was so good, he was contacted by people who, of course, didn't live here, who were trying to sell, and he's in charge of this, and he's trying to sell land for people. And so this idea of land ownership is already somewhat in question, by the time that Columbus becomes a, um, a city, uh, which will be much later in, in 1812. Um, and because of this, um, we also have a diversity of people that you may not realize. So if you're on one of my walking tours, one of the first things I'll probably say to you is, say the word P-U-S-H. Push or push, right, push or push. I, um, in 1950s, um, linguists could already stand or still stand on the corner broad and high, and they could tell you what part of the city you were born in based on how you said that word. There's a subtle difference in dialect. To have an actual boundary, a physical boundary, like broad and high, as a, as a uh, marker for a dialect is very rare. It's an Isengloss, and you could nail who was born on the west side, who was born on the south side, who was born north 
all the way through. Think of the State House. The State House is on one big 10-acre square, very Virginia, very Virginia. Of course, so were most of the, uh, the people who were sold out of Franklinton. These are part of that old Virginia family. Think of Worthington for a minute, four little squares, as New England as you get. You know, it's already in sort of the way the land is embedded. And then take yourself over by Mifflin uh, Township, and Mifflin is the name of the governor of New York. So people are coming in from New York, and they're coming in from Pennsylvania, and they're settling in what would be present-day Linden. So there is a, this distinction of um, dialect and other things coming in. By the 1840s, and I know you're probably going to think that I'm making this one up, but I'm really not, um, we are starting to lose as a city as many people as we're gaining. At one point in the 19, uh, 1840s, um, there are 11,000 people who leave the city and 11,000 people who come in. And the 11,000 who leave say things like, getting too crowded in here. Look at all this city, you know. We're moving. And you can actually track their movements into Iowa and other places because of what they name places like Deschler, Iowa, you know. Uh, th New Columbus, always a good tip off, right? And think of all the places on a map that are labeled New California. Well, we didn't make it that far, but if we just call it California, the weather's got to get better, right? Um, <laughs> At the same time that there are Germans who are leaving to go on further out, uh, or excuse me, I would say Germans who are coming in, and they're coming off the canals and they're coming off the railroads in the, in the 1840s, there is a group of Wyandotte Indians coming down South High Street. Think of yourself in front of Dempsey's or by the courthouse, and you pass them there, and they are on horseback, and they are heading for the railroad depot because they are going on to Shawnee Hills which is Shawnee Hills, Kansas, is the direct result of the migration of many of the Indian tribes in Columbus. They are led by two young men whose mother was a, uh, they were brothers, his mother was Native American, but they in fact are, their father was white and they are actually college educated and they're both lawyers. And they decide that they would rather hang with the people who need them the most and they leave and migrate on. We are a crossroads, we are migration. So, I started to ask myself, what about the people who don't come in and don't have everything? And these are the people that I'm going to call the other for a moment. Because, and this is where my other part of my life comes in, especially in Poland, was um, in working with Polish teachers, the very first lesson I ever sat in on was the seventh grade classroom in Warsaw, in which there was a object lesson was being made that um, there was, first of all, there were no really seminal documents that Poland was guiding itself by for a new democracy. They were relying on the United Nations Human Rights Declaration. And so the kids were picking apart the declaration and trying to apply it to their daily life. And so the one little scenario the kids had to think about was, your father has said if your grades go up and you do very well in school, you can um, go to this amusement park and you can take a friend and your father will pay for everything. You know, this is going to be great. This is incentive. So you work very hard, your grades are good, and when you come home and you say, okay, I'm ready to go, let's go. And who is your friend? Well, my friend is Giorgio over here. Well, He's a Roma. Gypsies are in Polish. And we would get this over and over again, and yet they were living in the shadow of all of this. And if it seemed bad in Poland, it was really more awkward in Slovenia and Slovakia and later in Hungary, that these were the other. I would sit through conferences with uh, people who would say the Holocaust would have a terrible impact on Poland. Polish were victims too. And we came to accept that, yes, the Polish people suffered very greatly. But when the statement came to being, um, if there were still Jews in any number in Poland, it would be wonderful because they were, and I quote, the word was exotic. They were exotic. And I always found that strange because I, I think in best intentions, I think people thought of them as colorful, different, um, different food, different dress, whatnot. But once you make somebody the other, what do you really do to them? And when I looked around in Columbus in schools and I was teaching and kids in neighborhoods, there were a lot of others in front of me and that's what mirrored my Cleveland background. Because my father was Jewish and my mother said I was never to date Jewish boys. My father was an early member of the NAACP, always working in African American neighborhoods. I say this kind of jokingly, but somewhat lovingly, that my mother was probably the kind who if asked by someone on the Klan to sew a robe, she might have done it. 
Um, she was Hungarian, but she came out of a different background. And that's what it took me a long time as an adult to sort of sort out what we do to our own communities and our own histories and our own families. We only know our own histories probably three, maybe four generations if we're lucky, where we've actually had personal contact with them. But in the meantime, it's the stories and it's the feelings that other people have that come down to us. So my mother grew up as a Hungarian in West, uh, Western Pennsylvania in a coal mining camp. And it took me until I got to Columbus and worked in the Hungarian community on the south side to understand that um, one of the larger Hungarian communities on the south part of Ohio was later uh, named Congo, because that's where the African American workers were put by the coal mining companies to always let everybody know who would be the first to come in if there was a strike. It's the same story we heard about Buckeye Steel, where Reeb and Hosack were the only given away uh, houses by Buckeye Steel, in effect, as a gift to always remember who you owed your allegiance to, where people come in, who is the other and who is not. And so this represents a, a large part of um, some of our own peculiar problems in Franklin County, uh, some of which have yet to be discovered by historians, and, uh, and yet it's, in, it's a tantalizing look. So as we get into the 19th century, I think the things that strike me most are the stories where there, it's a compelling story. Um, we did a survey, not a survey, we did a report for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I want to recognize my mentor, who happens to be here this evening, who I didn't know was coming, but that's Rita Smith, who's sitting in the front row. Rita is a, a treasure. She is a national treasure, especially to Columbus Landmarks, who sat down one day at a Bob Evans, uh, with us and said, I have a dream. <laughs> and believe me, when this woman has a dream, you listen. And, um, uh, and it was really about trying to understand a lot more about African American history in Columbus. And so we wrote a grant to the National Trust for Historic Preservation with the idea of starting to uncover some of the stories. And I don't think we really fully understood the whole nature of all of what's going to lead up to the founding of Arlington by year what life was like in the 1917, 1918, 1919 era in which Arlington is coming online as the birth of a dream, how many other dreams were out there, and I think that was the, the greatest gift of this. So some of you know that Rita, of course, is also associated with the stories that came out about stories, Secrets Under the Parking Lot. And in fact, Mary Rogers, who is the head of the Clintonville Historical Society, had told me that story some time before, about the bodies buried at Union that were reburied there because of the Upper Arlington football field and the, the family uh, that was uh, part of the ownership uh, in this area uh, that was quite sizable and uh, farmed quite a few acres. I remember being on tour once, and I wish I could remember her name, and maybe uh, some of you will know and be able to help me with this, who sent me clippings later from her family, and this was before uh, Rita and before that report, and their farm was what became Lane Avenue Shopping Center. And in fact, it was part of that family who helped to name the word, the name North Star, which was always curious because I think a lot of us looked at that like, is that a reference to the Underground Railroad? And you know, where did that story come from? And in the pictures that she gave me, they were from newspaper clippings, uh, when you go back through and you look at them, you realize that there are African American workers in the picture. The family's in front of the house, and they're standing there, and there are people in the background, and clearly there were people in Columbus who were the other, I'm going to put it that way, for a very long time before Columbus really grew into the 20th century. We don't know where they were in Franklinton, but we find them in early histories. We know that one of them has uh, come up uh, probably with Sullivan family, Sarah Sullivan, Lucas Sullivan's wife was much younger than he was. She was raised in Kentucky on plantations, and, uh, and yet uh, there was, a, we think, a fairly strong stream of people on the Underground Railroad coming up from the river that we don't have any record that Lucas Sullivan ever turned over to authorities. He kept a blind eye on all of that. So where people are living and how they are are really sort of defined by the fact we are in the middle of nowhere. You can essentially be outside the city limits and you can be in a township area, you can be in a rural area, and you can try to carve a little bit of a life for yourself. And that's what's happening pretty much in Clinton Township. So where are the people and who's working and whatnot? 
is kind of interesting to me because at Indianola, um, before other schools were built, like Kingswood, which now is a computer center, Indianola's boundaries uh, came all the way over through Columbus to the edge of Arlington. And so we had Buckeye Village at our school, and we had uh, Sellsville. And I think some of you know about Sellsville. Um, there is a member of our board, uh, Landmarks Board, who's just going to publish his book on Sellsville uh, that coming out, I think, in the spring. University View, uh, University View is, uh, yes, part of it. University View is curious because it's actually not a post-World War II housing development. It's built just before the war, but you couldn't get steel already, so there's no steel construction. But it is um, part, uh, I had a woman explain this to me once, uh, that it has very rich gardens because of elephant poop. And she was absolutely convinced of that, you know. So they actually were the, uh, the grounds for uh, the Sellsville. But Sellsville drew Roma children to Indianola. We had, we had full-fledged, I would say, Romanian-looking gypsies. Uh, we certainly had a population of, of, of very mixed, different heritage than you would have found at Wyland Park. And it was part of that sort of where do people come from and where did they settle? But uh, it does, Sellsville does not come into the city of Columbus until 1923 when it's labeled Gypsy Land, which pretty much tells you how the rest of the city looked at this area. So um, I think the one compelling story that I really do want you to get out of this, though, is that there, is, there are so many people trying to do the right thing in Columbus. I think white and black. Um, I look at the history of Linden. I just finished a timeline for North and South Linden Area Commission, and I, we're going to put it on uh, Landmark's website. And the interconnection on the Underground Railroad up Cleveland Avenue between the Methodist churches and Thomas Bull in Clintonville with the Southwick Good Funeral Chapel, a lot of you know is a, a bona fide site on the Underground Railroad, is very rich and very, very deep. Um, so there, the, it, it too becomes its own textbook of civil rights history. But what starts to happen by about 19, um, well, I'm going to say by the 1890s, starts to change whatever hopes we have of where we think the best and noblest are going to be. Uh, Ohio is a leader in the abolition movement, but um, it is one of the first to start to turn on the abolitionist movement uh, by 1876 uh, with Rutherford B. Hayes and the Tilden um, election when Rutherford B. Hayes and Tilden actually, you know, wins the actual vote, but the decision is made that if Rutherford B. Hayes becomes president of the United States, a good man, a man who, you know, helps to found Ohio State University, that's his pride and joy, quite honestly. Um, but the trade-in is that Reconstruction is at put at an end in the South, and that's when the terror begins, and that's when a lot of the uh, Southern sympathizers in Columbus, actually, who've been there kind of all along in some ways, start to reemerge to the point where by the 1920s um, there is a house on Bryden Road, which is the home of the Klan in uh, Columbus, Ohio. So let's get to that point with another hand up. No, uh, happy to entertain questions, really. I Sellsville, you're talking about where the Sells Public Circus right. wintered, which is now Grand New Yard, right. it's where the Big Bear Warehouse area was. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, uh, Sellsville is kind of under development with the Grand View Yard and things, although a large part of it is under a university view, the old university, behind the Lenox Shopping Center. On the other side of Lenox. Right, the other side of Lenox. So, so if you go down there, you can still sort of see there's one house left on King. That was the cookhouse for the Sellsville Circus that's still there, although it's been moved from its original site. Um, um, there was a, a, a history done some time ago by the Weisheimers, Carl Weisheimer on Sellsville. And one of my favorite anecdotes really was um, uh, belonged to a man named Mr. Yost. My first husband actually owns the old house in Hillier that Mr. Yost owned later, so I guess I feel a special affinity to him. Um, People who grew up in the Sillsville area were, uh, a lot of them were also marginalized in some ways. So it was African American, it was Italian, and I do want to assure you that I'm not making this up, but at some points in immigration law in the United States, Italians were not considered white. And so when you couldn't quite figure out which of the 13 ethnic boxes people fit into, much less ever deal with a mixed marriage, 
uh, and where I come from in Cleveland, believe me, um, a German and a Hungarian marrying, my parents were in a mixed marriage. I mean, we have very strict lines, you know, where that one went. Um, but Mr. Yost was, um, he would call the rest of Columbus townies. So if you lived uh, on the other side of the river in what would be Denison Place, Victorian Village, you know, whatever, you were a townie. So he was dating a townie girl and he had a motorcycle and he drove it over the Fifth Avenue Bridge and coming back at 11 o'clock at night, his, the headlights of the motorcycle picked up something in front of him and it was an elephant coming right at him on the Fifth Avenue Bridge. And at that point, he abandoned the motorcycle and climbed up into the girders of the bridge and just waited for it to pass and then got on and called the police. People would talk about the corners of their houses missing. I think for me, the most horrifying thing was when the monkeys got loose. You know, monkeys with little hands and they're all over your house, you know, and they're kind of nibbling away like you're out of a fairy tale or something. So it, it, they're great stories, and, uh, but it was a very different part so much so, as I said, that up until the 1920s, it's still considered to be um, gypsy land. Okay? Did you have a question, too? Right. Mine was the same. What's well, Sells Avenue and the Lenox Center. Right. Sells Avenue and Lenox Center. And, um, and by the way, that's one of the reasons why that area is all old industrial, because it was outside of the city. And there is a, something else that happens there, we're going to talk about in a moment, how these smaller uh, industrial areas emerge and what they do to housing and to fair housing in the city. So on the one side, you have a, a very lovely picture. This is 1908. This is going to be Columbus. And if you're trying to figure out where in the heck are you standing downtown, it's you are <laughs> good luck on this one. It's kind of like you're in a drone hovering over um, the State House, and you're looking west. Um, and you're looking at all of that land in Franklinton and on the west side, and you're envisioning a grand mall. And there was a study done, and this is interesting because this is all pre-zoning. Most cities were uh, coming up with planning commissions. Of course, there was no such thing as a bona fide city planner at the time, but for the most part, they were movers and shakers of cities, and what were their dreams going to be like, and what would you like to do? Well, it's interesting that they picked the west side for a, a number of reasons, but um, you are looking, it would be the Grand Mall, which would have not only the state government and um, the county government, but it would have a governor's mansion, and it would have all these wonderful amenities. And then the 1913 flood comes. Um, great urban renewer. Um, but sometimes I don't think we realize how devastating that flood was. So by the time you're kind of picking through the remnants of the flood that went all the way out to Central Avenue, and when, by the time the waters of the Olentangy and the Scioto joined together in March of 1913, on, and it rained for days and days and days, and the flood suddenly broke what we were the dry earth and dams, there are about 100 people who will die in Columbus. There are more than 300 in Dayton. We are not the hardest hit, but we are definitely hit by this. And what you really have is you have refugees, and you'll have them for the next 20 or 30 years. And you have no ability to have housing in any part of that west side, which traditionally had been the oldest neighborhood, which traditionally had been sort of an Irish neighborhood. It was definitely a very working class neighborhood, because once Columbus is founded on the other side, of, uh, of the river, of the high side, on the state house, more of the wealthy families are going to move that way, except for people like the Sullivans. But Sullivan is also on his deathbed for the most part. And so the boys, who we know found Ohio State University and Ohio Historical Society and a number of other places, uh, are, um, they're very west side boys, but they're also in a very different privileged circumstances. For the most part, the people on the west side are just kind of working, working poor, and now they're out of homes, and where, where do they go will be the next piece. So if you turn the page over, um, what you have is, uh, and I should have put this on here, it's a McKendry thesis. This was a thesis done in 1918, although it wasn't really published until about 1928, and it was a comparison of neighborhoods in Columbus. This is the most confusing map to read. If you have a pack of colored pencils and patience, you go back through and you kind of you try to redo the key a little bit to read it a little bit better. But McKendry's point was to compare two neighborhoods at first, what he called the Bottoms, which is the old traditional name for Franklinton, and the new rising neighborhood in, uh, in the city, 
which was not Upper Arlington at the time, but was the university area. And it was where, uh, of course, the president of the university lived, and there were a lot of houses being platted on uh, Iuka Ravine, which is where I live, Indianola Forest, in those areas. The city limits in Columbus to the Civil War had only reached Fifth Avenue. Um, in 1871, the university finally makes the decision where they're going to actually, the Board of Trustees, settle will be on the old uh, William Neal property. William Neal is the big landowner. Remember, land is power. Land is everything. When you have no money, whatever in the city is, you pick up more and more land. Goodale will pick up land. Sullivan will pick up land. Neal will pick up land. And he'll eye the old Vance Farm. And the Vance Farm is what uh, will become the original, that's the original tract of land um, that Ohio State will be founded on. Um, so right at where Mershon is, was the old president's house was actually the old Vance uh, farm. When Neil dies, he deal, he, Neil is dying at the exact same time Ohio State is looking for property. They go as far as Springfield, Ohio. They go down by Greenlawn. They look at various other sites. And the usual story is that there is a German trustee who says, he goes to Mirror Lake, which was a natural artesian spring, and he drinks of the water. People would go down there to gather the water, and, uh, and he said, this is the best and the sweetest water I've ever had. We find this hard to believe, but we accept this with some, <laughs> with some reservation, you know. When the university does buy the property by the next 15 years, city services will catch up with this part, and there will be city water put in, and they puncture, a new sewer line punctures Mirror Lake, and it will never have sweet, wonderful water again. It's artificial from that point on, and mercifully so artificial, I guess. Um, but the girls get the land. The boys get the businesses downtown. So of the two girls, uh, Elizabeth J. McMillan and Ann Dennison, who's married to a Civil War governor, and that house is essentially there at 15th and High, the Kappa Sig fraternity. That's an old Neal mansion that's left. There are a couple other outbuildings that we know of in that area. That is their farmland. Henry Neal, the youngest of the boys, uh, does not have to go to war, to Civil War. His brother-in-law, for heaven's sakes, is the governor. If you, anybody could have gotten out of it, he could have. But instead, he decides to go. And this raises a couple interesting questions, one of which kind of touches back to something on the Sullivans. There are families who come into Columbus early who are from Kentucky and Virginia. Remember, there's no West Virginia until after the Civil War. And they have been part of slave-owning families. And they make the decision to come into Ohio uh, essentially uh, as a, a statement that they're going to make that they don't want to be part of that. Many of them will come in with people who have raised them as children, people that they've known other lives. The Neals are a good example of this. And they come in with a, a, a black man and his wife, Ambrose Juris and his wife, who are buried with the family in Greenlawn today. And part of that is because they come in now as employees. And this is a very interesting dynamic, a kind of a shift here. Henry Neal, uh, however, decides to join the war. And he is uh, severely wounded, not expected to live, at the Battle of Iuka at Indianola, Mississippi. So if you've ever wondered where the words come from, that was what he comes home and names his plot. So, so the, boy, the boys get the businesses downtown, the girls get the land. The first thing they start to do is divide up the land. Elizabeth J. McMillan will have studied with Frederick Law Olmsted that as a woman will never get a degree in landscape architecture. But she designs the circles area. So if you know off Neal Avenue where the circles are that are beautiful, everybody thinks it's Victorian Village, it's the university area. Well, a descendant of hers is pretty well known in Upper Arlington. And that's wh where the King Thompson connection comes in. And so this idea of designing and using landscape and providing for the homes and thinking about this all together starts to come uh, sort of naturally, I guess, within the family. Um, so much so that I have to tell you, there is a, there is a, um, hmm, what do I say, an object lesson we sometimes use in the university area because we have, as you do too, probably the brochures, the early King Thompson real estate brochures, um, and there is one um, that was just given to me where, um, when you open the page, there is a picture of a house on Lane and uh, Indianola. It would be on the south uh, east corner of Lane and Indianola. And behind it is an apartment building. If, uh, if any of you, I'm sure it's that you've got these images. If not, I will share them with you at some point if you want for the historical sighting. 
And it says, this is a King Thompson brochure, and it said, this will never happen in Upper Arlington. This will never happen in Arlington. You're not upper yet. This will never happen in Arlington, meaning this beautiful house. And then right there, there's this uh, sizable four-family brick apartment building suddenly in its backyard. Nicely done, but it's apartment building. Well, the joke is, who built the house? King Thompson. <laughs> and that's my point. This is all about land, and it's about where you take the next opportunity. Much of the university area was coming online and turns over quickly because Arlington is coming online. And then the squeeze place starts to, to work a little bit more. So as you look at the map that is on the side of 1918, you see various ethnic groups that are relegated to various parts of the city. And um, I love the one where it's Romanians down there. It's actually Hungarians, but at that particular time in 1918, the fight was between uh, the Romanians and the Hungarians over Transylvania. And so that was a large part of the Hungarian population of Columbus out of Transylvania, so now it's labeled Romanians. But you see little pockets where there are families, where there are black families, and you see um, other places that are trying to sort of distinguish themselves by geography, just as I said, Milo Grogan was an old Irish and Italian African-American community actually called Goose Pond at one point for its um, uh, all the feathers that would fly in the air when they were doing the plucking of their, their goose down feather comforters. And, it, and it's interesting to look at, but it's only a tip of the iceberg. So let me ask if there are any questions we have at this point. Mm -hmm. Where are the English Okay, I'm sorry. English, Dutch, and Norwegians. I wouldn't say we have a whole lot of Dutch and Norwegians at that, time. at that time. And remember, anybody else who is sort of out of English tradition, you're already here. And meaning that they're so integrated into the fabric that they are the dominant ethnic group within the city. Sullivan is Irish, for instance. Sc the term Scotch-Irish, by the way, only applies to Protestant Irish, not Catholic Irish. And so um, they're already, in 1918, looking for the people who are not like themselves. Does that make sense? So that's how they're, they're making that as distinction. Well as, the Welsh and the Scotch. Uh, as well as the Scotch. As well as the Scotch are very integrated. The Welsh have a small community. Actually, they have two. One is on Long Street around the old Welsh church, and the other is in North Columbus because William Neal brought them in. So around what would be the Arcadia, Hudson High area, there is a Welsh community there. The, the wagon rights that uh, rebuild the, the road all the time that William Neal gets contracts from the state of Ohio for. When you say they're already here, are you thinking the late 1700s? The oh, no, they're coming, in by, uh, they're coming in by the 1840s. And they're already here? They're already here. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So they're already settled? They're settled. And their decision there's, there's is? There's not necessarily, but they look white. And they're part of the majority in that sense. I mean, I'm just being totally honest with I, you. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I know you are. All right. And, and so they're not the power mongers. Um, there are a few that will emerge. Um, you know, individually, people, but this is a very German city for the most part. And so, Columbus. right, by the 1840s, the Germans are coming in. Uh, and remember, 1848 is the landmark year in European history where there was a revolution every three months, someplace. And so, uh, they're, they, they are, they're coming in. And what, the interesting thing is what's not on there, I'm glad you're getting to this, because yeah. there are also, uh, Yes, I, I think I do, because there's also, and I love this in early Columbus history, there is on Cleveland Avenue a group of thugs. It's a place where, um, it's actually it's been an area that I've done a lot of research on called the Badlands at some point, which has some very decent people living there and also some people who are more of a kind of a gangster nature. The gangster nature are French Huguenots, and you would never ever think that Columbus would have ever had more than four to form a gang, you know? Uh, so it, it is interesting how we get these little traces of people and then they sort of integrate right away. But so around Leonard Avenue, in fact, Leonard is obviously Catholic who starts St. Mary's of the Springs for his own daughters. That's part of that, um, that French connection in his case, although he's not a Huguenot. In your research, do you mm -hmm. notice a lot Let's do this. Misspellings, intentional misspellings of words mm -hmm. that are last names and surnames. Right. So it's hard, is it difficult to trace really the ancestry? Or is there a pattern to it where you can 
think a good guess. I, I think it's a good, about names and, um, right, it's about names and if there's um, a problem in trying to trace names through misspellings. So intentional uh, intentional. And possibly intentional misspelling. Uh, and I think that's a good question for a genealogist. I, I'm sure there's some discernible patterns, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't want to go out on a limb and say that because I've never done research in that area. Okay. Oh, it's uh, a McKendry. M-C-K-E-N-D-R-I-E. It's a McKendry thesis, and um, uh, you know, you can certainly contact me after this if you want the full bibliographical. I'd be happy to give it to you. The original McKendry thesis was done at Ohio State, and it was so important that it was published and republished and republished. So you can find it. You can find it online. You will find the text of it. What's sad is the original thesis has been gone for a long time, and in it were tipped in photos of intersections and places in Columbus, which I think a number of us only have or have in Xerox. So you could have seen what the corner of Fifth and High Street looked like, or um, one in Clintonville in which you can see three mansions, and that's about it, you know, and those are gone, but the text is still available. Other questions and things? Oh, I'm sorry, right there. Is that the same McHenry as a former McHenry United Methodist Church near Northern Lights? No, it's not. It's spelled differently. I <laughs> but it is spelled the same. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay. That, but I, and I can give you the full citation for it. I should have thought to put it on the bottom. Okay. Could I go back to the French Huguenots? Uh -huh. I thought they were downtown, but not. They I'm sorry, were, please? The French Huguenots. Uh -huh. Where did they settle? There was a, in, um, was in Alfred Lee. Okay. Oh, here, I'll do it this way. And okay. uh, her question was, when did the French settle, uh, Huguenots settle? In Alfred Lee, one of the older histories of Columbus, he puts them along Harbor Road, which was the old name for Cleveland Avenue. And, um, and he says that that is, he intimates, let's put it this way, that it's one of the reasons why Harbor Road, Cleveland Avenue, becomes um, ultimately um, a path for, a known path to the Underground Railroad, because law enforcement didn't go in there. So, okay. Did you have a question, sir? No, I was trying to get a okay. copy of it. Okay. 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 Now, now we get to the heart of something that will drive you crazy, except for Rita, who I'm going to rely on here a lot. So you have this wonderful map of 1918, but in actually doing that report for the National, um, uh, Reg uh, the National Trust, the Historic Places, there were a number of other things that came up. And so uh, what you have is, I'm going to borrow yours for a moment rather than dip back in there, is my handwritten copy that I have never really put into some sort of public form that starts to try to uh, segment out other neighborhoods and where are people. And um, I rely on Rita to kind of talk about this one too, if you'd like to with me, because what has come up, for instance, was the name Mudsock. And um, this was the most bedeviling of all of them. We have small African American communities that are so old that we have actually ignored them, forgotten them, bypassed them. But why are they there is the question, in part because there is no other place who will take them. And there is no other place for them to settle. And they're best if they're self-sufficient, at least, with some ability to have some um, agricultural ability uh, to be able to do a little farming. One of them would be one you might have heard of, American Edition. So American Edition, for instance, um, is both a place where by the 1960s, it's pretty awful, but you have people sometimes in the Great Migration who are living in boxcars uh, off of there that last into the 1940s. It's a, it's a neighborhood that's completely forgotten about, and yet, it's also a neighborhood where the Keltons of Kelton House, Kelton, I think a lot of you know the Kelton House story, will give as a wedding present to the son of Martha uh, Lawrence, who is the young woman who grows up to marry uh, in the house, and their son, Arthur, becomes a pretty famous doctor in Columbus, and he gets land there. Um, so it is a place where there are people who are, I don't, if I said summer home, that is hardly what it is. But it, it's an ability to own a little bit of land, and it's ability to have it, you know, all to yourself. 
there is a, a very telling story of, um, oh, I was going to say mud sock. There's a, Rita, correct me if I'm wrong. There's kind of an Upper Arlington mud sock and a Hilliard mud sock. Am I right? Where there are two different communities. Can you say a little bit about that? No, no, she can't. No, she doesn't. <laughs> but um, the name comes from the fact that when it was muddy, the um, horses would be tromping in mud up to their knees, and when it dried, it looked like they had on mud socks. Okay, so that's mud sock. So actually, every place in Columbus could have had a mud sock at this point. Um, across the street, and this is the curse of knowing a little bit too much about history, I think, even driving over here tonight, I'm passing the Panera on Lane Avenue, and um, there is the old Holiday Inn, right, and which was actually built by John Glenn. I want you to know we do remember him fondly. That was one of his enterprises. Um, and there's Panera, and Panera sits on a, the site of an old African-American Italian neighborhood. These are the people who helped build Ohio State. And they're not alone in this. Um, workers from Alabama would come up in the summer and live in boxcars in the uh, stone quarries off Grandview. Uh, and they would come up in the summer here because the wages were better and it was cooler than Alabama, um, which was um, not a surprise, I guess, except lately. And um, they would be working right outside underneath the Kasparis Castle, you know, which we always think of with Marble Cliff and uh, that area. Um, and he, by the way, is not married to an Italian woman. He is married to what they would call an English woman. And um, you would think we're talking about the, the Amish at this point, the Amish and the English. Um, but she um, would not allow him to, to uh, even though he was very wealthy, uh, to have anything to do with his own Italian roots except on Christmas Eve when little girls uh, from the Italian community on one side of Fifth Avenue were invited to come into the kitchen to sing Christmas carols in Italian to him. That was the only time they were allowed in. Grandview, uh, everyone says, is a very Italian neighborhood. It's not. Look at the boundaries. It's Columbus. What you find is that Fifth Avenue, for Italians and blacks especially, is one of the first demarcation lines. It is the first color line of trying to cross. And so uh, think for a moment, just kind of think laterally here, from Milo Grogan, go down Fifth Avenue, go on over until you're in Grandview, until you're on this side of the river, all right? And if you uh, were Italian or African American, you could not buy north of, of Fifth Avenue. There were deed restrictions all through the university area, through all the suburbs, through Columbus, through what would be Denison Place, all of that that were in there. And um, at the time, most people are assuming these deed restrictions are um, kind of mandated by law. No one's, def no one's um, sort of um, challenging them. They are part of what we sort of inherit by both po popular culture and public policy. And I will get back to that in just a moment. But um, uh, the uh, idea of the uh, Italians uh, in Grandview is a particularly interesting one. There is a book I was going to pass around so that people could uh, look at that. In fact, there's a couple I think I'd like to pass around and give people a chance. And it's this one right there. Planning for um, private investment. Um, Grandview may be the only municipality in Ohio that actually passed a law that said Italians couldn't live in there. It wasn't a deed restriction, and it wasn't redlining, uh, but it actually was a law, of course, null and void now. By the way, um, redistricting, or excuse me, um, redlining is different than uh, deed restrictions. Um, my best example, I think, of redlining is one that's a little bit more of a modern example. Uh, at one point in the university district not so very long ago, uh, if you, you could not buy a house on King Avenue in the university district. Um, and if you went to a bank and asked for a mortgage, you could not get one. And if you went to the Board of Education and you said, where will my children go to school, they couldn't tell you because technically you didn't exist anymore. You were Battelle Research Park. Battelle had planned to take down everything in the King Avenue all the way to Fifth Avenue area. This is about the same time that there was an uproar about the loss of Union Station, which is what brought Columbus Landmarks Foundation into being. But it was the fact that Battelle, and this is a far different Battelle than we see today, I want to assure you, but um, Battelle at that time was uh, in violation of actually the original um, uh, articles of incorporation, the original intention of uh, the Battelle family. And so um, 
you could not um, uh, you could not buy in that area. Mike Stinziano Sr., who was the father of the present pro tem of city council, um, had to go to the legislature. Of course, he was a politician to ask, in essence, for a special special dispensation to allow him to buy his house on King Avenue because uh, no nobody would lend to him because it was redlined. It was already off limits. Mm -hmm. My grandmother had lived on King on Fifth Avenue between Michigan and Pennsylvania. I remember the fear that that entire neighborhood would quote go Battelle unquote and be torn down. Yeah. And houses got moved, but their house is still there. Right, right. So a lot of that stopped by a federal judge and injunction against Battelle. Uh, and Battelle, by the way, is the only known example, I guess, even to the state, who ever lost money from the federal government for tearing down Union Station after they said they would not. And then 11 o'clock at night during the rain. The night before a football game, <laughs> it went down. But what I want to point out to you on the map that I've kind of given you here is there are all these little nodes, and they come in. You have to look at each one of them sort of individually. The biggest factor in the essence of time, I'll tell you, is you need to find where the streetcars are. Once the streetcars start leaving Columbus, because Columbus had horse-drawn streetcars at the time of the Civil War, but obviously they're going to become electric pretty quickly. The first streetcar suburb is actually on the Near East Side, which is out Main Street, uh, which is in the kind of the Old Oaks area, and they proudly and uh, proclaim themselves as the first streetcar district, and they'll go out through Driving Park. Um, one of the other major routes will be out Sullivan Avenue. Sullivan Avenue is a curiosity because it never crosses the river. You know, it sort of parallels broad on the west side, but it comes right down, you know, into, uh, stays on the same side of the river. Um, another one is Clintonville. Another one is Fifth Avenue. Every place that you see uh, a streetcar coming out, and we can get old streetcar maps for you, those of you who are curious. Cleveland Avenue is obviously another big example. Um, will have deed restrictions on either end of it. Because what is happening is that private developers are coming in and they're buying strips of land and one after the other will put in a deed restriction. Zoning is fairly new. Zoning doesn't come into Columbus until 1924, I think. It's officially passed by city government. The plan for 1908 uh, was now put on the shelf. There was no ever way to implement the plan of 1908. Occasionally, there are some glimmers of it that will turn up in the Civic Center, how it's handled after the flood. But with, uh, with zoning coming in now, the usual argument is that we want to protect homes. And the thing that you protected was a single family home. You actually, you didn't want apartment buildings. You didn't want renters. Now there's a distinction between the have and the have-nots. Are you a renter or are you possibly going to own your own home? You also have, especially out Cleveland Avenue, and I have an entire list of how these, these pieces of, of Linden get picked apart. You have businessmen who will come in and they will buy entire blocks of that subdivision purposely to be renters. It will never ever be able to go on public market to be sold. It will just constantly be rented. Uh, with zoning laws come a couple other ways to restrict things, and one of them has to do with front yard setback. So if you are in the Cleveland Avenue area and it's a nice middle class neighborhood, or even Clintonville, and you have a 30 foot setback on your property, it's pretty generous, and you're thinking, okay, I got a tree out there, you know, looks good, got a place for a little garden. The American dream, have grass, don't grow veggies in your front yard, and, uh, you know, don't be like my Hungarian, you know, relatives. And, um, but now it's one upsmanship because the house may not change, but now the setback is 50 feet. And it will then go to 75, and it'll go to 100, and it'll go larger. And it'll do it especially in Grandview, Upper Arlington, Marble Cliff, wherever there's a chance to be able to have a little bit more land because that setback will be everything. And it will be sort of your guarantee that your property has been, um, uh, the value will never go down. The real estate ads are unbelievable in the 1920s, unbelievable. I have a real estate brochure, an actual brochure, not an ad in a paper, that is from um, Baby Farm. And I don't know if you know where Baby Farm is. We actually did this on a WOSU production at one point. If you go up um, I-71 and you take the first exit to Morris Road and turn north as if you're going to Eastland, okay? 
and take the first exit off Morris Road and turn down into the street to the right. You look at the neighborhood and you think there's something a little different here, but I can't quite place it immediately. Most of the houses are small, some really beautiful little gems there. In fact, there's one from the 1950s, looks like George Jetson lived there. Others are like little cottages, but they're sitting on enormous pieces of land. Some are four city lots and some are eight city lots. And um, there are uh, fruit trees that have been planted at some point. There are also no sidewalks. The people up there, this is in the Northland area, don't want sidewalks and they don't want street lights. In fact, they fought the city not to have them most recently because they like that kind of very rural nature. And it gets its peculiar name, and it's on real estate maps as Baby Farm, from the fact that you could buy the tract of land. They were not giving you the house. You build anything you want to there. And remember, there was no zoning necessarily up there for this. But um, you would have a place to have a small truck farm. You could raise a family. You could make sure that everybody always had enough food to eat. You know. Um, and so this beautiful color brochure I should have brought tonight has pictures of children on it and sun monnets and women and um, little lots laid out and it's, oh my God, it's so idyllic. And in the tiny little print there it said, uh, come see our lots on Sunday, April 10th, uh, free five pounds of sugar to every white family. You can't get a little bit more explicit than that. And that's what real estate ads look like in the 1920s all over. So um, the ones that are the craziest to me are the ones sometimes in Linden. Because Linden is never a farming community. Linden is um, farms, but not in agricultural production. It is really more of a railroad town. In fact, Linden is an old railroad term, just like Evanston. So on the upper part of East North Broadway, some of you may know that was a separate community. That's why the houses look so different on East North Broadway. That's where the rich and famous were supposed to live, and then they could take the train downtown to work very much like the main line in Philadelphia. Um, Evanston is a railroad name given to that stop on the railroad. Linden is a railroad name given by the railroad to a stop that was there because of brickyards. So what starts to happen when people are buying these lands up to sell, uh, there's one ramp to my favorite is just north of Hudson and it is called Highway Manor. Now, can you think of a worse name for branding than Highway? Doesn't that make you really want to live there? You know, there on Highway Manor. Um, and these are absolutely outrageous. So, you've got a couple of factors working here to kind of gain us a little bit more speed on this topic, I guess. And that is that you have um, other demographic changes that are happening. So let's fast forward a little bit into post-World War II. Many of the decisions in post-World War II are made by the Metropolitan Committee of Columbus. This was pretty much six really good people who were shakers and movers. You know, there's uh, Simon Lazarus is on this and the mayor is on this and um, uh, Galbraith has not quite introduced himself yet into this. He's still kind of a budding neophyte in the development world. Um, but the decisions are, we, we, need to, we need to look at what's happening in Columbus. We need to plan. First of all, we haven't had stoplights for um, four or five years. One of the reasons Columbus has paired arterial streets is because we had no money for traffic lights or stop signs. We still live with that. So, uh, so all the streets suddenly became one way this way or one way that way. It was a way to cut down on accidents. And if you think accidents didn't happen, in the first year after World War II, in the town of Lancaster, there were more deaths by traffic accidents for lack of traffic signals than there were people who lost their life in World War II than young people in Lancaster. So the city is dying for lack of improvements. And these, uh, the Metropolitan Committee decides to look at every school issue, every bond issue, and make a recommendation to the city. They also know that in 1949 is the first of what's going to be the investment acts given by the federal government, the first bit of money that will become available for what's called slum clearance. Over a billion dollars and $500,000 in grants, cities will have to have a plan and they will have to come up with some way to um, implement it and they have to get public support. So some of my favorite ads in the newspaper are, Clintonville Women's Club is bused down to Flytown to see how horrible it is so that they'll vote for the bond levy. You could have gotten on a bus in Columbus and been in Flytown, but they bring them down because that's the voter base that they need and it does work, so the voters do support this. 
what the 1913 flood had already gotten rid of, what the racial segregation patterns had already enforced in terms of who could buy or could not buy, and you could not get loans if you were black. You could not. Columbus was unusual in that it actually had a black savings and loan, a small one, on Long Street, a building, unfortunately, it was just lost, that was a real icon in the community. The Adelphi Savings and Loan Company was actually able sometimes to make small amounts of money. In other cities, by the way, and I haven't found evidence of this in Columbus, but I'm almost positive it's there, like Detroit, uh, black families could not get loans prior to World War II or even after World War II. And so who do you go to if you need to get a little bit of money? You go to the place that might have money because they have a good practice and they're licensed and they're reputable and they're seen as icons in the community. They're sort of community bankers. You go to undertakers. And undertakers do finance a lot of black loans in other cities and they may very well also in Columbus. Um, you still cannot get financing from the federal government, even if you're a veteran. That's why Hanford Village is built separate from, it's on the east side, built for the Tuskegee Airmen in effect, or the men who served, who were Rickenbacker, uh, Lockbourne is what they'll always say, we say rock, uh, Rickenbacker today, and that's a separate community for them. So every single one of these little communities has its own point of origin. But I wanna tell you about one, and that is, um, uh, uh, Burnside. All of a sudden I was stuck on Briggsdale. Um, the west side has very few small or large African-American pockets on it. It's a pretty white enclave. And you know Columbus. Northerners go north, southerners go south, west siders stay west, and east siders stay east. You know, we're kind of segmented that way by habit and tradition and churches and patterns of living. But the west side is sort of interesting because there are three small areas uh, that have traditional African-American um, homeownership, not homeownership, but rental and, and community. And each one comes in differently, but each one is uh, illustrative of something. There is a small area behind what had been the hilltop area where the lunatic asylum was. Of all of the areas of Columbus that had what were considered to be model state places, the deaf school, the blind school, those were all in very exclusive residential areas off Town Street, Broad Street. Children could not play in parks. That was very much a given. Um, it wasn't until the progressive era of the 20s that children sometimes got the right to go in a park. It was uh, private carriage lanes for people who wished to go there. Children, keep your place, be in the street. Even on Bryden Road, children were not allowed to roller skate on the sidewalk, you know. And they could roller really skate in the street. Don't you just love that? Um, but the, the, the and lunatic asylum was a different animal. There was a stigma to it. And so the people who needed to work there got housing very close to there. And for a lot of the West Side development, even though they were definitely needed places to be because of the, of the flood that had been in Franklinton, it was not a place necessarily where a lot of people were gravitating to, especially around that area. Um, sometime in 1904, there is a groundswell, and by this is not huge, but a little bit more movement of uh, families looking, but they're looking immediately and in the middle of the night. In Springfield, Ohio in 1904, a race riot was started by the railroad company themselves to throw black workers off of the railroads and to hire whites because they were getting, they were getting pressure to hire whites. Blacks were coming up from um, uh, the south, that's a part of the great migration of which Columbus will not be immune. There'll be hundreds of people coming in, literally with the clothes on their back and nothing else, to try to escape from the South and to find something decent here to be with. The East Side becomes the largest predominant black community, taking a number of the people in. The stories of the churches on the East Side who themselves are struggling and how they provide for other people is absolutely pretty much gut-wrenching, to be quite honest. And, uh, and now you have the Springfield race rides and people are fleeing in the middle of the night to just to find sanctuary. There is another little community though about Burnside. Burnside is so close to Sullivan Avenue, it's about where Sullivan and Demarest come together. And if you go back there, you're not gonna find a whole lot. But it was the place that Booker T. Washington, who spends more time in Columbus than Teddy Roosevelt, which is hard to believe, seems to come to a lot. 
And he comes there because there's a family who lives there who is as noted an educator as Booker T. Washington is, and that is Bird Prillerman. And Bird Prillerman is kind of an unusual name, so we can track them pretty easily because I've taught with a lot of the Prillermans. They're in Columbus schools, and Bird Prillerman IV is one of the teachers I mentored and worked with at Afrocentric. The Prillermans, Mr. Prillerman, Professor Prillerman, is actually a very educated uh, educator. There's a high school name for him in West Virginia, and he's a good buddy of Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington will come to visit him all the time. But what's the community he's in is a little more than ramshackle. In some cases, there was not even enough material to build a house. And so when paving bricks came up, they actually just took them and made a house out of paving brick, and that's how they lived. This is the neighborhood where Nancy Wilson comes from, the singer Nancy Wilson whose father worked at Jeffrey, which is really on the other end of town, around, you know, uh, first and second and north fourth. A year ago, when we did cultural walks, four cultural walks in Columbus, and we were on Westgate, which is a beautiful neighborhood. Uh, 1920s curvilinear streets, it's a textbook of classical revival architecture. And I had brought them a real estate ads, and I never said much about it. I just said, hey, look at this house, you know, does anybody live there now that you know and whatnot? We, we talked about it that way, but it was not such small print where it always said the words restricted, restricted. So if you were nice, you said restricted. If you weren't so nice, you just said whites only get the sugar. And um, uh, it was like nobody had ever seen it. So the day that we did the cultural walk, we, uh, I had at the end of it, or at the back of a side of a sheet, I put a little history of um, the community, Burnside. It's where Camp Chase is, the Confederate Cemetery. In the Confederate Cemetery are buried people who are marked citizen. Those are often African American slaves who followed somebody into battle, that family, and were also captured. The citizens of Columbus by 1862 had felt in the Civil War, why are we harboring, we've done all of this about abolition, but why are we um, protecting um, why are we castigating these slaves who have come with their masters into uh, a prisoner of war camp in which there's a great deal of disease and death? And um, so they got a special mandate from the uh, state legislature to free them. There were, we think, 89 people that were freed, 89 men. Where do you go? It's the middle of the Civil War. Suddenly you're free. Okay, walk across the street. Do what you can, but you know, don't count on us to be there to help you. And that's how the beginnings of Briggsdale start, a kind of as a, really a throw together little rural community that eventually is just going to try to integrate itself within the thing. So at the end of this culture walk, three ladies who were my age, I kind of figured this was pretty safe territory here, came up to me and said, we had no idea where Briggsdale was. I, and they had lived in Westgate all their lives. It was a matter of walking across Sullivan Avenue. And I said to them, uh, you, did you ever, didn't you have black students at West High? They're all West High, you know, people. And they said, oh, yeah. And they were really nice families. And, and I said, did you ever, where did they live? And they said, we don't, we have no idea where they lived. You know, have no idea where they lived. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to take a stab here that you were in either high school or college. As I was in college, actually out of college, during predominantly the civil rights years. What was ever said? at West High School about civil rights. And um, they said, well, really nothing. And if we asked our mothers, and every one of the three ladies said this, we asked our mothers once, where do black people live on the west side? And our mothers said, ladies don't ask questions like that. And that was the end of the discussion. So you have a lot coming together in various communities. But for the most part, Arlington represents a dream but it re represents a dream where other people were being squeezed. And I think that's not, there's no uh, um, correlation there that I'm trying to make. Just simply that the ability to own was so out of reach, and each time there was a natural disaster or a war or the loans couldn't be obtained or the federal, uh, the Fair Housing Act was telling us that urban renewal was coming or the freeways were coming in. Every single one of those was a squeeze. So when you read about Linden in the newspaper, know that Windsor Terrace public housing was put exactly where it was because there was already too many black people in the city that didn't have a place to live. And now we'll move the next boundary to Hudson Street, which is where longtime activist Clarence Lumpkin said, 
I didn't buy my house in Linden because it was beautiful. I bought it because it was the only place I could live, and he could not live north of Hudson. And so it, this will be the pattern repeat. Um, there is one last handout for you that won't need much of an explanation, and you're being very patient, because um, I was so impressed with the story in the Upper Arlington History Book about the students who passed a resolution uh, about, uh, about living in Arlington and about the nature of being in a diverse community. Um, for a long time, I worked with the Annenberg Foundation and developed a program in Columbus that was about students, mm -hmm, um, thank you, that's very good, students who um, actually didn't just pass resolutions, this is many years later, um, but actually worked to implement something. And I would hope that that might be something that Upper Arlington would like to work on more. But I found this article and I thought that Maybe this is something that you don't know about, I didn't know about, and it's something that you might want to find interesting. It's about, it's come from the Columbus Call and Post, 1972, uh, and it is a coalition of 19 churches in the area and what they did to solve housing and how it impacted Arlington. And the results are still yet to be seen. So we'll take questions, and I think I've gone over my time, and yes. So I learned from watching Columbus neighborhoods that streetcar uh, lines in Columbus were all privately owned. Right. Do you think that then helped, say, Arlington become an exclusive, expensive community because the streetcar line went there? I know it's not there anymore. Right, but right. Was there a correlation with that? I don't think so much w that there was a correlation with the streetcar as it was with the size of the lots and the ability to never even get into the, the game. Just didn't have enough skin for the game. That, that's essentially my guess. You're also not on a north-south axis in quite the same way that some of these other streetcars were. Are there other? Oh, please. The question was, where do people go after the 1913 flood? And most of them will go to the hilltop. But, okay, here's the point. Remember, by that time, in the 20s, the hilltop would have been restricted for blacks, so you've got whites who can move up into the hilltop, but not blacks. Um, and another example of that um, is essentially uh, our next door neighbor, who is Serbian, who grew up in Milo Grogan and talked about it as a very uh, racially mixed neighborhood. And her family moved into Linden, and she said, we couldn't understand for a long time why other families didn't. Well, it was Fifth Avenue. They couldn't because it was the wrong side of Fifth Avenue. So even if you moved out, you might look at your neighbor and say, come on, you can do it too. Well, no, you can't. And that's, I think, what happened on the west side. I have two questions. Um, could you just remind me, you were talking about the difference between redlining and Deed restrictions? Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, they're different. Yeah, I, I think the easiest way to think about it is that in a development, um, all of those houses are essentially sold to people who agree that they won't uh, do chicken slaughtering, you know, won't sell to an Italian, and won't do this and that, and that's to protect the value of their home. Whereas in redlining, it is a decision made generally by institutions as to what their plans are. Um, one example is when urban renewal finally comes in and the handwriting is on the wall, it's 1949, uh, everybody knows that by 1950, Columbus will be poised to get some of that money. James Rhodes is Columbus's youngest mayor. He's gonna be followed by Sensenbrenner. Both of them, for instance, will agree that the old market Mohawk area, the central market area, uh, is definitely in need of uh, slum clearance in their mind. By the way, slum clearance was sometimes defined by that era already as um, not just about dilapidated housing or who had indoor outdoor plumbing, but by the rates of venereal disease or children born out of wedlock. You know, very social factors which are pretty shocking today. And they will designate three areas, uh, uh, Flytown, the Goodale area, the Central Market area, which is Market Mohawk, Children's Hospital actually gets the lion's share. They'll get 55 acres. And then as an afterthought, this is a good example of redlining, suddenly North Campus is built at Ohio State. And it is built from Frambies to Lane Avenue. They will wipe out a middle class neighborhood and call it blighted because they will, um, the university has a master plan and they want to grow those dormitories. And so they take it under slum clearance. And cities made money in slum clearance. 
Um, the other thing, going back to Grandview and Italians, did you say the demarcation was Fifth Avenue? Um, yes. In fact, it's really funny. I, having just done a tavern tour on Fifth Avenue, what's very funny is how many places market themselves as Grandview. Grandview this, Grandview that. They're all in Columbus. Uh, and, of course, over time, there was more that was annexed into Columbus. But um, my, I enjoy especially the examples of uh, when Grandview drew some of its boundaries, if there were, and this is true, if there were two Italian families who lived at the end of a street, they drew the city boundary around those houses and then went on to the rest of the street. So even the Pizzutis, others who started with restaurants, they're on the Columbus side. They're not on, they're not on the... Mm -hmm. I was going to bring up Right, right. I came to be a student this evening, and this has been wonderful. But when you asked the question about the West Side, where Afro-Americans live, they lived on three streets between mm -hmm. Broad Street and Sullivan. Uh, they were uh, Oakley, Wheatland, and Highland. Mm -hmm. And it was just between Broad and Sullivan. Mm -hmm. I remember in the 1960s, when I tried to get a house on the north side of Broad Street, that person was let go because they had shown me that house. Right. But, um, and my parents ended up on Clarendon. My father seemed was rather fair as an Afro-American, and my, my mother was very brown-skinned. Mm -hmm. But Daddy had already signed the papers, mm -hmm. and by the time he got the house, but when they came to get their signature, there, oh, there was my mother, and she was just as pretty brown as she could be, and it was too late. They had to sell it to us. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I think it's interesting that uh, Jesse Owens lived on the west side in his in a, uh, uncle's house, I believe. He could not ever find dwelling in the university area. He never ate a meal in the restaurant on High Street, never went to a movie there. Every day of his life was the student union on 12th Avenue for a hot dog if he was lucky. And uh, for others, like Chester Himes, who becomes quite a known literary person, three years before Jesse Owens is at Ohio State, Chester Himes will get himself into some trouble, wind up in the Ohio Penitentiary. But in part, he's in trouble because um, he was only one, well, certainly uh, less than 100 African-American students with absolutely no support, no support. And no other place to go except the Near East Side to nightclubs and other places like that. <laughs> um, I am happy to continue the conversation in any way that you might want, uh, meaning individually or however, and I love it if you think of things afterward. Uh, look for a, a, th a couple things online that we're going to put there, like the Linden Avenue timeline. I think you'll find that interesting, and it does talk about the segregation of the schools and why everybody knew it was going to come, the violence would come at Linden and East High School, and there's a reason for that, and it had to do with housing. But uh, I can be reached through Columbus Landmarks Foundation, uh, and I'm happy to give out my email or even my phone number. And I want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.